I've shut these three down already. These are the only two operating ones in California. This is San Onofre, and this is the Rancho Seco. Uh, excuse me, Diablo Canyon. What did I say in Rancho Seco? How Diablo many did Canyon. you say there were? Sorry? How many did you say? About 100. 100 are still operating right now. If you look at it worldwide, there's about 440-something nuclear plants. And the places where it's mostly used is right here. France uses nuclear power for about 80 to 90 percent of its electricity needs. Question? Why do they primarily use on the East Coast? High concentration of population and uh, not as many environmental restrictions. Now, when I say environmental restrictions, I'm not saying whether they're good or bad, but a lot of times, for example, California, they banned nuclear power. You can't even build one right here. So that's why there's only a couple dots over there. They're very useful. They're, they've proven, I'm going to show you in a second some of the, the safety records so that you can see uh, how, how good they've been doing. You want to have a follow-up question? Uh, no, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, uh, it, it could, but the, these plants are all over. It, not all of them are right on the coast. It just looks that way. Question? Uh, yeah. Um, you said it, it's not a matter of, like, um, bio, like that they're dangerous per se, but what about the byproduct? I'll get to that. Okay. Give, give me a chance to get there. Let's, let's look at the operational principles, and then we'll talk about the nuclear waste and the nuclear fuel cycle in just a couple of minutes. Okay, so don't let me get away with uh, not answering your questions. <laughs> Okay, the, uh, so the other thing is Japan. So Japan, small island, few natural resources, what do they do? Are they going to buy oil or are they going to build nuclear plants? Well, they chose to build nuclear plants. Same as Korea. So you can see the concentration. The United States, Europe, Japan, and Korea. And then there's a few. India is, is uh, really coming up in the world on that. And China just got started and they're... They've got huge plants to build uh, plants, uh, nuclear plants all over the place. So one of the things that people are worried about is what's the safety record of the nuclear industry. And everybody talks about Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, right? Everybody talks about Three Mile Island. Well, in Three Mile Island, the only person who was injured was the guy who had a heart attack when he heard that there was a nuclear platform in <laughs> There really wasn't any. Now, the plant was destroyed... So it's an economic disaster for the company that built it, and that's probably why they haven't, uh, you know, been so many uh, nuclear plants built in the last couple of decades. But from a public perspe uh, perspective, very safe plant. So I'm going to talk about Chernobyl a little bit more in a minute. But if you look at as the number of reactor years of operation has been growing, see the amount of experience that we've gained in operating nuclear power plants, and uh, thank God, with no uh, problem, Chernobyl, just in case you didn't know where Chernobyl was, in the middle of the former Soviet Union over there, right in the middle of that green dot, Chernobyl, that was a case in which the reactor design itself was flawed. What do you, what do you mean by a flaw? A flaw is... If you don't account for the fact that accidents will occur, then you have a flawed design, because if an accident occurs and it blows up the reactor, that's a bad design. And they designed it to have steam right next to graphite, high temperature. And you can't do that. Graphite hitting graphite causes an explosion. No U.S. or any other reactor design manufacturer has that kind of an arrangement. So people design reactors that have graphite cores, but they cool them with helium. Helium and graphite don't have a fight. Graphite and steam have a fight. So first of all, it was a bad design. Second, the operators had purposely turned off the safety systems so that they could do some training. So again, in the United States and in most places, you can't do that. You, you, you don't shut down the reactor safety system for any reason. And so 
you have that combination and you have the seeds for a disaster, and sure enough, uh, I mean, a lot of people died. Uh, lots of areas were uh, you know, destroyed and, and prevented from being useful for you know, many, many decades to come. But there is no, see, the problem with radioactivity is that you can't tell when, if you die, yes, you know, you got, that, that's, that's it, that's the end of the story. But cancer is really hard to figure out if it's going to come, when it's going to come, so it's really hard to pinpoint it, and even the body has a lot of mechanisms for healing itself. So there's a UN report that showed that there's no scientific evidence of significant radiation-related health effects. So the, the, the public normally deals with what's the chance that I'm going to get ill. So it's kind of like a fear, a fear response that's built in. And again, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, but the more um, knowledge you have about a topical area, the less the fear factor comes into play in your regard to that technology. Okay, so remember I told you guys that the, the neutron and the uranium-235, uh, it, it prefers the thermal neutrons. Well, there's a cousin of uranium-235 called uranium-238 that prefers fast neutrons. And the wonderful thing is that there's a lot more U-238. As a matter of fact, to prevent reactors from blowing up, they make their neutrons thermal, and then they make the concentration of the uranium-235 only about 3 to 5 percent of the overall uranium. So most of it is uranium-238, but the neutrons are thermal, so it's a controlled, therm uh, controlled fission reactor. But when you get U-238 and it absorbs a neutron, it becomes uranium-239, but 23 minutes later, it has radioactivity and it becomes uh, Neptunium-239, which has another beta decay in a couple of days and it produces Plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 is another one of those fissionable uh, isotopes. So there is a way to breed fuel using the Uranium-238. So they call it a breeder reactor is because it makes more fuel than it consumes. Here's what it looks like. There's actually the Super Phoenix in France. France never stopped their nuclear program. They continue developing all of its nuclear capabilities. So the thought was, when you have this uranium-235 and U-238 initially in the fuel rod, they were thinking, hey, the 238 is going to be absorbing stuff anyway it's going to be producing plutonium-239. Let's reprocess that fuel and make some more fuel and have a nice little cycle that just keeps making fuel. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of uranium-238. Uh, let's just use it to keep the, the, the lifetime of the fuel going. Uh, there were proliferation concerns. Proliferation is the code word that people use for fear of nuclear weapons uh, falling into bad people's hands. And so, oh, before I get there, I don't want to get there yet. I'm not going to give you the, the, the secrets yet. All right, so that was the breeder. So we talked about fission. Fission breeder uses the same principles, and it uses the same neutrons, just a different energy, to create more fuel. That's fission. You're breaking things apart. Fusion, on the other hand, is when you take stuff together and you mesh it hard enough so that it creates these two guys. And it's funny because when you had fission and you added up the weight of the fission products and the neutrons, it was less than the nucleus, than the uranium-235 plus the neutron, which meant that energy had been lost. And that's, I mean, mass had been lost, that's what created the energy. The same thing happens with fusion. So if you take the mass of the deuterium, that's a heavy hydrogen, and the tritium, really heavy hydrogen, and you fuse them together, and you add the mass of that, and you compare it to the mass of the helium and the neutron that's formed, again, it's less. 
So again, energy is released through the fusioning process. Just so happens that the law of nature is that both the little guys, when they fuse together, and the big guys, when they fission, wind up releasing energy. Most of the stuff in the middle, like iron, won't fission because it, it won't create anything that loses uh, mass. So fusion is the release of energy by combining two light nuclei. And look at this guy. You also made a neutron again. So be thinking about that, right? Uh, there might be a way to use that neutron at some point. Let's think about that. It's a very high energy neutron, by the way. MeV means million electron volts. It's almost equivalent to uh, 10 million degrees. So how are you going to fuse these guys together? Uh, well, you know these these are uh, charged particles. So when you take a solid and you add energy, it becomes a liquid. And when you take a liquid and you keep adding energy, it becomes steam. And if you take steam and you keep adding energy, it becomes a plasma. A plasma is nuclei that have been stripped of their electrons. So they're just pure, plain old nuclei, highly charged. So nuclei are all positive, right? They only have protons and neutrons. So what are they trying to do? Repel each other. So they're trying to push each other apart. So how are you going to hold these things together to get them to fuse? You've got to do two things. You've got to get their temperature up so you can just keep them together. And so this is million degrees. You guys know the Kelvin scale? Yes. Kelvin scale. Thank Centigrade in 273, when you're talking a million, 273 doesn't mean much. So this is a million degrees, 10 million degrees, 100 million degrees, and so on. So you've got to get the ions, the ions to get really hot. And you have to hold them together at a high concentration for a long enough time. And so here's what's been achieved in the early 70s. I got my PhD like right around here somewhere. You know, things were looking really bright. And I, I actually went into fusion research. That was where I started, at General Atomic right down the street in San Diego here. So I actually built fusion experimental reactors and turned bolts and did calculations and all that. Right around here, I did a seminar that said that we will have scientific demonstration of fusion in 1980. Here we are, 20 plus years later, and the scientific demonstration of fusion is still another 20 years away. So we haven't made any progress towards that goal. We've learned quite a bit about how difficult it is, but we're still nowhere near being able to build a fusion reactor. Okay, so um, we're still pretty far. So there's two approaches to achieving it. One is by magnetic confinement. That donut shaped thing is called a tokamak. T O K A M A K. Tokamak design. It consists of superconducting coils. If they're not superconducting, they're going to use up all of your power just generating the magnetic field to contain them. So they're superconducting coils. So superconducting means that they're at what temperature? Close to zero, right? Close to zero. And what kind of temperatures do you have in the middle of that reactor? A million degrees. We were just talking about 10 million degrees. So can you imagine the gradient of temperature between the center of the reactor and the superconducting coils on the outside? That's a tough row to hoe. So that's why it's so hard to do that. So there's this thing called the thermonuclear experimental reactor uh, ITER that's being built right now. It's going to be built in France. So they got the site. But all the countries of the world that are, have major research programs are contributing resources, personnel, ideas. Uh, the United States, Russia, uh, England, Japan, so all the majors are in there trying to figure out how to make this thing work. One of the problems of this design 
that little neutron. That neutron, it's not charged, so it doesn't care anything about the magnetic fields. It goes out and it bombards everything that it sees, creating radioactive particles. Because many elements, when they absorb a neutron, if it was stable before it absorbed the neutron, it becomes unstable after it absorbed the neutron. So you're creating radioactivity within this structure. So this reactor would have to be remotely maintained. That's very difficult to do. So that's the magnetic approach. The other approach is inertial confinement. So inertial confinement means you use uh, momentum to confine it. So they have this thing up here in Livermore National Lab. They have this facility that was just recently dedicated in which they take lasers and they, they split the beams into I forget how many different paths. And so they fired at a little pellet of deuterium and tritium. Now remember this has to be cold because deuterium and tritium are gases. So you got to get it cold so that you can get this pellet in a solid form to get the concentration up and blast it with a laser. And I forgot to give you a picture of a pellet. Darn it. I'll have to email it to you. Later. So the idea is that you have to have a mechanism that fires these little pellets, and when the pellet gets into the focal zone of the lasers, all the lasers fire, and boom, you get fusion. So then you do that really fast, fire the laser really fast, and you do the same thing. You take the neutrons, turn them into heat, and convert it to electricity. So the, re the reason I waited, okay. Uh, let me talk about the nuclear fuel cycle next. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about your question about the nuclear fuel cycle, radioactivity. So, I talked about few, uh, fission, fission breeder, and fusion. Fusion uses deuterium and tritium. Those are gases, different isotopes of hydrogen. The reactor is really far away, so I'm not going to talk too much more about fusion unless you guys have specific questions. You're more than welcome to interrupt me and ask me questions. But I want to talk about a little bit more about the nuclear aspect that's actually more relevant to what you guys are interested in. So you take the uranium and you mine it, and it's converted to this gas, uranium hexafluoride, because it's easier to do the enrichment. So remember I was telling you that you, that, that you have a certain percentage of uranium-235 in the mixture. Well, it turns out that nature only gives us 0.7% of uranium-235. So You've all, I'm sure you've all heard about Iran using centrifuges to increase the percentage of, of uh, uranium that they have of the fissionable 235. So what they're trying to do is to increase this enrichment from 0.7 all the way, and I told you 3 to 5 percent is what they use as fuel. They want to get to 80, 90, 100 percent, much as pure as they can get so they can get, so they can make a bomb. But for a reactor, you just enrich it to this amount, you make the fuel rods, you run them in the reactor, and then here's where the radioactivity is made. At the end of a nuclear fuel cycle, you have these fuel rods that are very radioactive. They have all these uh, fission products. Those fission products are very unstable. They produce all kinds of radioactivity. I'm going to talk about radioactivity in just a minute, so I'll catch you up on all that. But you've all heard the concept of radioactivity. So it's highly radioactive. What are you going to do with it? Well, we already said a little earlier that you've got valuable fuel that's in there. So really it would be cool if you could come into a reprocessing step, take the plutonium, mix it with some of this, and make some more fuel rods. So not too many people are doing this now because of the fear of proliferation. So what they're doing right now is really just storing it. They're coming this way. They're calling it all waste and disposal. So they're saying take the nuclear fuel rods and store them on site where you have a reactor uh, until we can figure out what the United States is going to do with all that. And it's either going to be vitrified, it's going to be turned into kind of like a glass cement mixture that will be hold for 10,000 years. How long has the human race been around? 
maybe five to six thousand years, you know, civilization. Can we even imagine what it's like to hold these things for ten thousand years? I, I don't, I don't know why we are even considering this thing. It, it just seems so logical to me that if we can protect the route, we would take this stuff and reuse it and just dispose in a cavern or someplace, just hold it in a geologic formation that we know has been around for millions of years. I'm sorry, say again? Have you proposed that idea that you have to like explore what we Yeah, they're already considering them. But the, the, the problem is that during the 70s, when all the problems with nuclear were coming out, they were mostly fear. They were driven by fear, emotion about radioactivity. And engineers and scientists are very logical people. And so we would argue on a logical basis with emotional people. Have you ever argued with an emotional person? <laughs> Do any logic make sense? No. So we lost that battle. We lost that battle. But all the ideas are, I mean, these, these are not new ideas. They've been around for 15, 20 years. The technology has continued to improve. If the idea was good back 20 years ago, it's even better now. So there are a lot of technological solutions, but the politics of this thing are horrendous. As a matter of fact, they just closed down the idea of storing this at Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain is a very solid, stable geologic formation out here in Las Vegas. They, they, they did away with that. That whole thing, the whole controversy with Yucca Mountain, wasn't it because um, they thought, it wasn't it because like the barrels, they thought if, if there was a leakage, it could leak into like some supposedly some water system that they found there? And that's what they were afraid of? It's, it's a bunch of things in a row, okay? So first of all, you've got this stuff immobilized in a tank. Yeah. So you've got to have the tank. Then you have to have an earthquake occur that ruptures the tank. Then you have to have a leakage path all the way to the water. When you put all these probabilities together, it comes out to be infinitesimal, and engineers have a tough time saying zero. The chances of something like this happening are zero. And as soon as you don't say zero, then there's some chance I don't want it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and so we have to learn how to differentiate between practical zero and real zero. So it's just a long way. But here's what these fuel rods look like. So schematically, you've got those little pellets that I was telling you about. They go in here, uh, and they're contained inside of a, uh, uh, they call it a cladding, zir zircaloid. Pin out a zircaloid, which is a, a metal. Uh, it's got zirconium and a couple of other things that contains it in there. It's cooled by the water, so that as you the fusion as the fission reactors are occurring, the water is rushing through and carrying away the energy. Um, let's see, water, the pellet, uh, a couple of other engineering uh, features that you need to you know kind of keep the whole thing together. Then you take these individual rods and you put them in a fuel assembly. So you can see all these fuel rods are held together by these grids that maintain them in place. And in the middle, you put the control rod assembly. So you, you kind of get the idea that you have a way of moderating the number of neutrons that are going in and out of this various uranium-235 because these, the control rod has a very powerful neutron absorbing material. And as I told you before, very few materials fission. Mostly they just absorb the neutron and the neutron is gone. So it gives you a very easy way to control the reaction that's going on in that, in that fuel rod. And then uh, here's a real picture of uh, uh, a, a reactor in, the, in the, a re fuel rod in, in the Ukraine. And then when you take all of these, you store them. Here's the storage pond. They just take them out and they put them in a storage pond. So right now, all reactors in the United States and many around the world are taking their fuel rods out and putting them in storage. Why do they put them in water? Sorry? Why do they put them in water? It's the easiest, you, uh, easiest way to keep them cool. They're still, remember, they're still radioactive, so they're generating heat, even though it's not at the same rate that they're generating it in the reactor, they're still hot. And so you've got to remove that heat and keep it cool. The other thing to note is that in comparison to like a coal plant, 
that has tons and tons of waste products, you know, the, the, the exhaust and the carbon and all that, that builds up. The entire fuel of a reactor for a year fits inside this room. So you could have 30 of these, and you still don't have a very large facility. You could store this fuel pretty easily. So fuel storage, waste storage, fairly straightforward. Okay, so why don't these reactors explode? All right? Does a bread loaf explode? No, right? Bread doesn't really explode. But yet there are grain elevator accidents. Because depending on how you treat powder, you could create the conditions where you could have an explosion inside of a grain elevator. So the form of the explosive is very important. So the same thing in a nuclear reactor. The nuclear reactor has, first of all, very low enriched uranium. It's got all kinds of other materials that absorb neutrons. It's got the control rod. It's got the water all around it. And they're being designed in what is called a fail-safe mechanism, that if all the water drained out, the reactor would shut down rather than overheating. So there's a lot of technical design that's gone into the redesign of nuclear reactors. But on the other hand, if you have highly enriched uranium, and you've got fast neutrons, that energy wants to get released right away. And so what we have is a situation in which you could have a gun-triggered fission bomb. So you need a certain amount of fission, fissionable material to have criticality. Okay, so those reactors that I was telling you about, they have a certain amount of uranium, and that makes allows them to go critical. If you don't have enough, these neutrons just go off, and they don't have enough to create a chain reaction. Once you have a lot of this material around, it's called a critical mass. So the idea to create a bomb is to have two shells that separately have enough material. Each one of them independently uh, doesn't have enough, but when you put them together, it does. So here's an explosive charge. So here is a uranium sphere, which does not have enough uranium to go critical. But you have whatever is missing right here. So you explode this, you fire that into here, all of a sudden, this has a critical mass of uranium. And, let's see, detonate. So it fires in there and you get one of those. Okay. That's one kind of nuclear bomb, all right? There's another one called Batman. Okay, Batman, th these, are actually, these are actually real bombs that were used. The real name, Little Boy and Batman, were the first two bombs that were used in the world. I mean, those are dark days in our history, and we have to hope that they never get used again. But those are actually what they used to end... Um, World War II, at least as far as the Japanese were concerned, and some people say that even though a lot of people got killed, that the net had the war continued, when you consider the rate that people were dying, it may have saved lives. I, I don't want to get into that debate, but I just want to present both sides of the story. Uh, so there's a different kind. Remember I told you about inertial confinement? So you could use the same approach. And also remember that I told you about neutrons. Beryllium and polonium is a very efficient neutron emitter. So the idea here is to maybe have enough material there, but not have enough neutrons. And now what you do is you implode this thing, so now you have a very efficient way to capture all the neutrons. And so it's internally, and then it explodes. Okay? But remember I told you about those 14 MeV neutrons from fusion. Yeah, you have a question before I get there. Uh, Batman. 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 Can you do that? <laughs> sure. So let me show you. Uh, let's go back to the first one. 
So little boy uh, had a 14.5 kiloton yield. They, uh, they're, they're still measured equivalents of TNT. And it had 14.5 kiloton yield, an efficiency of 1.5%. Not very, not very efficient as far as the use of the material is concerned. It's still very efficient for releasing energy. So this one, it fires the missing material into the ball. And then you have enough for criticality. This one, 23 kiloton yield, an efficiency of 17%. And look at this number. The fission occurs in 560 billionths of a second. So it's a very fast process. And so the idea here is that you implode a beryllium polonium. Um, uh, you implode the uh, uranium into the beryllium core, which has a lot of neutrons, you implode it, and then it explodes, because you have the criticality and again. And that happens once, once it hits the ground, right? No, they it's, it's timed. Time. All of that is very, it, the timing is very, very critical. That was one of the things that they had to solve, one of the engineering challenges that they had to solve. When do you give the signal for this thing to occur? I mean, you certainly don't want it to happen when you're in the plane, and if you're the pilot. Um, so it's got to be dropped, and there's an optimal dispersion pattern, depending on a certain height. And what you do is you might have sensors that are pressure sensitive. So as the atmospheric pressure increases to a certain point, it triggers the control circuitry that then makes all these things fire. So that's actually one of the key uh, uh, technological features that enables somebody to build these bombs. Without those sensors, you can't do this without killing yourself. The last one, go ahead, one more question. Oh no, thank you. So, fusion bombs are the best as far as producing uh, a lot of power. So these, uh, let's see, 700 times greater than a little boy, had 10,000 kiloton yield. So, and you can have multiple ones on the same warhead. So here's what it looked like. Now you use a fusion bomb to set off a fission bomb. So let's see. Lithium deuterate. So there's, here's the lithium, uh, the deuterium. You don't have to have deuterium and tritium all the time. There's many other reactions that also, that also use little isotopes. Lithium is one of those. So here's a lithium deuteride mixture that also creates fusion. And again, it's the same kind of a situation. You, you just kind of get the fusion bomb to, to go off and set off the fusion bomb. Okay, so enough of destruction. I have, I have a question about the nuclear bombs, though. Is it possible to use, because um, I know we've, we've gone through the whole disarmament uh, in the United States and in Russia. Is it possible to use nuclear bombs to power nuclear plants? Great idea. As a matter of fact, one of the first uh, concepts for powering nuclear flight in space was to fire off nuclear bombs and use, remember I was telling you about the direct energy conversion, use direct energy conversion to keep moving yourself along. Uh, politically, again, it's probably unthinkable. Technologically, it's very challenging to do that. So conceptually, it's a good idea, but it's very hard to implement. Um, where does the energy that um, starts off the fusion bomb come from? Where does the energy that starts the fusion bomb come The fusion bomb, again, from the implosion. So they implode, make the lithium and deuterium generate the neutrons, then those neutrons set off the fission reaction. So the radial compression of the of the fusion is uh, one of the key inventions of uh, the Teller uh, uh, design. Uh, regarding the nuclear weight, uh, isn't it like possible that once you find the weight of Like a, a radioactive 
So the question is, if you take this nuclear waste and you put it away somewhere, wouldn't you be able to come back later on and you know, maybe in 100 years we've got better technology, maybe revisit the issue? The answer is yes, but not if you vitrify it. Because then you've, you've kind of made it so difficult to get at that you won't be able to do that. By maintaining it in the storage bins that they're doing now, they're actually trying to do a little bit of that to try to figure out, well, maybe we can get to the point where we can do some of that. So yes, that those reactors, th those fuel rods, still have energy, still have radioactivity, still have the all that uranium that I was telling you about and the, and, and the plutonium. So just to tell you a little bit about radioactivity, I think we've got just a couple minutes left. Okay, so. You guys have all heard of alpha, beta, and gamma? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So alpha, turns out, is really just the helium. That's just a word that they use called a helium atom. The beta is really just an electron. And the gamma is just a photon. Gamma ray, very high energy. So these happen naturally from unstable nuclei. So when you have a nucleus that doesn't have the right ratio of protons to neutrons, it does stuff. It could decay and, and eject a piece of helium. It makes it more stable. And again, if you look at the, the physics of this, it would show you that these two, helium and I forgot what RF is, but that is a more stable configuration than one big SG. And that's exactly what's going on in these things. So radioactivity is simply isotopes that are not stable with certain lifetimes, and they're emitting these three uh, uh, particles. Now, it's very easy to stop an alpha particle. Why? Because it's big and heavy, and it's very charged, so it absorbs, it gets absorbed real easily. I don't know that I would have showed a hand there, because that means that this guy just took an alpha to the finger. <laughs> a beta, a small piece of aluminum, will stop it. Gamma rays will go right through that, but they can get stopped by lead. And neutrons, which are uncharged and can penetrate more, uh, it takes a lot of concrete to absorb. So what I've done here is I've given you guys um, a way to estimate your own personal annual radiation dose. And we live in a radioactive world, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that you can go through for your own lifestyle, you fly, the higher you are, the less atmosphere you have between you and the cosmic rays, so you get exposed to more cosmic rays, there's higher, depends on where you live, what kind of house construction materials are used, uh, some places have higher radon concentration than others, uh, if you wear uh, luminous wristwatches, uh, there's a lot of radioactive things that are on Coleman lanterns. There's a number of different ways of measuring. There's a Geiger counter. So a Geiger counter is a very... Sorry, I meant like as like, um, how much do you use Right. So what, you're, what he's asking about is that what amount of radioactivity is bad for you? So we know that a lot of radioactivity is bad, and the more you decrease it, the less bad it is. And what he's asking about is, is that a linear function? So that no matter what amount of radioactivity you receive, there is always some badness to it. Or is there a threshold below which there is no badness? So maybe if the radioactivity is below a certain level, who cares? Your body can deal with it. You can just go on your life and it's no worse than, you know, eating too much pizza, I don't know, but uh, uh, nobody knows uh, whether it's a linear or where there's a threshold to that. Those are just used to do those calculations, which again are all relative, because everybody wants to know if I'm exposed to radio, if a population is exposed to radioactivity, how many of those people are going to get sick and die? And so depending on which model you use, it gives you a different answer. But it's like 100 versus 105. It's very hard to figure out what the real difference is. 
Um, which form of like uh, radiation is the one that causes poison? Is it all three? Yes, any of them. Right. Now, what happens is that you get them different ways because uh, certain isotopes will have alpha, beta, or gamma emissions when they decay. So, for example, iodine is one of those that you, goes to your liver. So that's what that they issue iodine pills. Yeah, it, it, back in the days when there was a lot of scare going on. If there was an event, they want everybody to take iodide pills because then your liver would be saturated with regular iodide instead of absorbing the, the radioactive iodine which would collect in your liver. So you're kind of telling your body, hey, fill up on, on the iodine now before the bad stuff comes around. So, you know, it, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, what I would call art to the, to the science. I gave you a whole chart on waste. Uh, I'm running out of time, so we can look at it at, at some point. But it's basically some of the things that we talked about. I did want to get to nuclear power applications in space, because if we ever want to go to Mars, we need to go nuclear. Why? Because if you use chemical, it'll take two years to get there, spend 30 days, and come back. Total round trip, two years. How would you like to be inside this room for two years? Not really, right? It'd be tough, right? There better be a lot of Scrabble games on board, or else you're going to be going crazy. So nuclear can do that round trip in 90 days. So when the astronauts found out about all these things, they asked that this option be explored. And so Orion, I, don't know, I, I just remembered the name, it was Orion was that concept that wanted to explode nuclear bombs to propel the, the spacecraft. So that was a concept that people were looking at. But they've come up with better ones since. So a million times more energy than chemical fuels, I told you that earlier. A lot of thrust, they provide heat. And when you move away from the sun, and solar power is no longer an option, you really have to have the radioactive sources. Medicine, industry, consumer products, scientific research, agriculture, law enforcement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we all know that nuclear energy is used now to treat patients. Oh, on, uh, on uh, the graph that had uh, radioactive waste Antimatter, right. So is that a uh, it, it, it does boil down to a nuclear engagement. You basically have two particles that are at the nuclear the level, nuclear state, interacting with each other. They just happen to be anti-particles to each other, so they, anni and they annihilate. So it is a nuclear, uh, I mean, it's, nobody knows how to even control that or even do anything with it. But that was on the chart. Okay, so we talked about, uh, I didn't talk about that, but applications of, of radio proton therapy, you're, you're able to target exactly where the protons are going to go to kill. Well, what does radioactivity do? It kills cells. So if you can identify where the cancer cells are, you can pinpoint these beams and kill the cancer cells. So Applications of nuclear science and medicine are, are just tremendous. Food irradiation, the same way that it kills people, it kills bugs. So if you take food, it's already dead, whether it's plant or animal, you're about to eat it, so it's dead. Uh, but there might be bacteria or other things in there, irradiate it. So as long as you do it safely for the people who are doing the operation, the radioactive process of irradiating with gamma rays does not alter the nature of the food. So from a technical point of view, being a technical person, I would prefer irradiated food. Why? Because I know there ain't nothing in there. You know, if you, you, if you give me one of those natural, no preservatives kind of thing. How, do, how long do I know it's been on the truck? Uh, so to me, food irradiation is a very natural extension of nuclear power. And then the other thing is um, landmines. So trying to find these uh, 
these landmines that are plastics, right, it's very difficult, but uh, since explosives contain a lot of nitrogen and oxygen, uh, if you set up, uh, you know, you, if you fire some, uh, some neutrons or some protons or some various uh, uh, radioactive materials in there, and you detect the signature of a radioactive nitrogen or oxygen, so in other words, you're intentionally causing radioactivity to occur in that area of a particular type, then if you could detect it, then you know that there's a landmine in the area. And you could use the same concept for luggage, because right now, plastics are very difficult. It's not impossible to figure out if it's an explosive or not in the airport. So these, could, uh, these techniques could really uh, be useful in the near term. And that's it. So I'll take some more questions and uh, comments. Yeah. Um, the one you talked about the, med the medical. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a possible way that you actual actually damage cells that yes. don't have that, that are good cells? Right. Right. So that's how they try to continue to refine the the, the tools. So neutrons. Are harder to control, so they, you know, they may have started using that. There's a lot more neutron sources, so they might use neutrons, but the neutrons are harder to control, so they may not be able to get to just the right spot. Protons are charged, so you can fine tune them exactly where they go. So if you know where the cancer cells are, you're more likely to hit bad cells rather than good cells. So yes, there's a lot of uh, that that goes on into the design. Um, so when they just die. They just die. They don't become radioactive. Um, so what's in a barrel of radioactive waste? So uh, there's two kinds. There's low-level waste and there's high-level wastes. And low-level wastes are stray neutrons that activate things to a certain degree. They're not that bad, but they're still radioactive. The high-level waste is those fission products. So when the uranium splits, it creates these two heavy particles. There is a random distribution of what those are going to be. In other words, it's not always krypton, and I forgot whichever one that was up there, barium. There's a whole bunch of these kinds, and there's a whole bunch of those kinds, and those have a lot of radioactivity within it. So that radioactivity is actually, uh, it exceeds the background radiation for at least 500 years. You're above what that ore was before you mined it out of the ground. So it's very radioactive, and it's just a bunch of, of, of isotopes like that. Antimatter? I don't know. I don't have a, a clue as to how to do that. I was going to say I'd like to have a patent on that. Sure. Yeah. You said the reaction hold on They absorb neutrons. So materials like boron and cadmium, rather than... Uh, just ignoring neutrons or, or becoming radioactive, they just absorb it. And they become a different isotope, but the neutron is gone. It's just a very good absorbent. The, they call it the cross-section. The cross-section for neutron absorption of these materials is very high. No, because uh, it turns out that the number of neutrons is small compared to the, to the density of the material. So you could use those uh, actually, what limits them is the damage that they get. So, from an absorbing point of view, they're still good, but eventually they become brittle from so much radioactivity. Yeah, why can't we harness that radioactivity into another source of power? Actually, it, it, it is used. So, radioisotope generators are generators that that have a, a particular radioisotope that has a particular decay pattern. For example, it might have uh, uh, a beta of a 30-day lifetime, which is just right. As a matter of fact, that's what they use for some of your the tests that you use. It uh, has to have just the right window so that you're radioactive long enough for the diagnosis to be made, and then you're not radioactive after that. So there's there's very very careful use of those radioisotopes for both medical and for electrical production. And so how would you say that um, energy, I mean, nuclear energy is um, contributing with reducing energy demand? Nuclear energy, in my opinion, is the best way to satisfy the baseline energy requirements of the world. 
there is no comparison when you look at it objectively from a, you know a technical point of view. Come on, argue with me. I know you don't, you don't agree with me. Okay. What is it? Come on. This is your chance. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. See you later. Yeah. So, so you agree with me or no? In a way. Okay. okay. <laughs> also, is it true that after like several years, like the nuclear power plant has to be closed down and like shut down and guarded because after several years, the the building gets like. So the question is, after a certain number of years of operation, do you have to shut down the nuclear plant? And the answer is yes and no. Right? So the nuclear plants initially designed were designed for 30 years. It turns out that engineers can figure out what's going wrong and correct it, and now those 30 years are being extended to 60 years. Right? So in the end of 60 years, you're going to have to decommission the plant, right? because at that point, it's going to cost you much more to try to fix the reactor vessel or the pumps or whatever is going wrong than any cost to just build a new plant. So you kind of decommission. So well, after it's closed, I heard that well, I learned from school that you, they have to like guard the area, they have to cover it up with um, like lead so the radioactive can go out, and the um, and they have to, people have to make the government have to make sure the people wouldn't um, go near their the closed plant. And well, again, it, it's probably there's a truth to what you're saying, but it's probably been exaggerated. There's radioactivity there, so you need to protect it because we're all curious humans, and we are going to go in wherever it is we're told not to go. But from a, you know, it's just a, it's just like any other protection. Uh, you're protecting people against unintentional or malicious uh, access to the site. So, yeah, you just have to protect. It. Well, since there's anti-matter and we're matter, and we're matter, and they're anti-us. <laughs> there, there is, but it would be very hard to make it long enough to exist so that it's exactly anti-you. The, the antimatter, as soon as the antimatter is made, it finds matter that's just opposite, like it, and it reacts and it's gone. To make an anti-U, you would have to have all kinds of matter, antimatter, hang around long enough to, you know, to be just like you, and it won't happen. It'll take too long. So, if it exists, I would have to avoid it, right? Yes, you better. Avoid it. <laughs> 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 we don't know. That might send that might send you to a new universe that we just haven't been exposed to. Um, how could would be the radioactivity? Is there like a possible way that radioactivity stays around it so when you consume it, it's cleaned out? There's no radioactivity whatsoever created or deposited on the food. It's like having a light. A camera ray, a photon, is just light. It's just a, a bunch of energy that just fires through and it kills whatever is on the way. So it doesn't leave any radioactivity. And can you use it to, for other stuff? Yes. Use it to sterilize. Right now, they use it to sterilize instruments. Uh, how much will last um, this? Uh, well, basically, this process. How much will it allow us to provide energy for the world at the amount of time? Uh, it's probably in the thousands of years. Only I say that because our energy use was really climbing rapidly. And it looked like it was going to be short, and then we leveled off. Now, especially with the recession, energy use is low. But if energy were abundant and we had a good economy, and energy use might take off again. And anytime you say anything like a thousand years, when you see the advances that we've had in technology in the last hundred years, I think we're going to make ten times as many in the next thousand years. So, you know, as long as you can look out beyond the next hundred, few hundred years. I think we'll be in good shape. Um, you're talking about the nuclear plant. Uh, it's just like a huge hot water for um, like heating homes. Like they actually do that in, uh, in some places in Russia. They use that recirculating loop, that last recirculating mm -hmm. loop, 
to, uh, to they just route it to place it. There's no radioactivity. It's three layers away from the reactor. So it's absolutely safe water. It's okay. Um, so that we're in California. Rancho uh, uh, Diablo Canyon. Um, so for uh, for fusion for nuclear fusion, um, how how much power does it give relative to nuclear fusion? Uh, let's see. Uh, it's about about the same. Yes, because a fission reaction yields 200 MeV, 200 measures of of units of of energy, but it's a much heavier particle. The um, the fusion yields about 14 or 15, but it's just much smaller. So per unit mass, they're probably comparable. So, um, but so when they would use the same kind of uh, processes that they use for fusion. No, totally, totally different. I mean, like oh yeah, yeah, water yeah, right, exactly, right, right. It would still use the, use the same thing. Yeah. And, um, so I'm following up with that. Um, do you? Like, I have two questions. One is, do you think that will we be, like, ever be able to reach a nuclear fusion? Or be able to at least contain it? Oh, for sure. And, oh, and my second question is, um, what are this, the byproducts other than, um, I guess, helium or whatever is being Well, you're going to be generating radioactive uh, structure. So, so there will still be radioactive waste. Yeah, but again, it's going to be much smaller because when you consider the size of the device, that's all the radioactivity that you're going to generate. So from the management point of view, it's going to be very nice. Last question. Two questions. Why do they call it waste if it's still radioactive? Can you still use it as energy? Because we, we're not careful in our language. If we were marketing people, we probably would have called it nuclear gold or something. I, I just, uh, and then nobody would have, everybody would have wanted it in their backyard. <laughs> but now they call it waste. and. But you can still use it as it's an energy source. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. You just got to be careful with it. Uh, a lot of uh, the other speakers have sponsored um, different alternative energy sources, uh, like solar. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the advantages that nuclear power would have over the other alternative energy sources? The, 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 the question is, this is a great question to end this, the, the, the discussion with. The question is, you guys have heard about all kinds of other energy sources. What's the key advantage of moving here? Who wants to give? Who wants to get a? Give me a shot at the answer. No emissions. No emissions. No emissions. No emissions right? No carbon emission. That's correct. That's a good one. The efficiency is just a little higher. That's that's a that's a mild extra because the. the the nuclear reactor operates a little hotter than you can operate the other ones, but that's only, again, only a, a, a marginal uh, advantage. I'm guessing it takes a, little, a lot less space. Less space. Less, less material. Less material. All those are good ones. I, that was one of the first things I said. Ten million times the power density. So if you're trying to provide a lot of power to a lot of people, one nuclear power plant can uh, replace fields and acres of all these alternatives. So is there room for everybody? Yes, because there's this thing called baseline electrical generation. You want to have a minimum amount of electricity generated all the time. And a nuclear power plant provides that like no other can. And then you can have all these others when the sun is up and when the wind is blowing and when the, the hydrogen is all collected. You know, all those are good ideas. But for right now, for baseline loading, my vote's on nuclear. Madame Julie, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, guys. <laughs>